So Tyler, t- tell us about your uh, your struggles getting a press pass. Why don't they just give you one, man? I know the word Kafka-esque gets thrown around a lot, <laughs> but I think it really fits in this case. Yeah, I don't know if, if, if any listeners have read the New York court dispatches, but um, we have been forced to go into the, the 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 line in which the public can attend these hearings instead of the press. The hoi polloi. Exactly. Uh, and that's because we have not been able to obtain a press pass yet because of very um, gatekeepy, I would call it, draconian, I would also call it, uh, requirements to obtain a New York City press pass, which require six live covered events uh, in New York City, in the five boroughs, which obviously raises a chicken and egg question. How do you cover these events without a press pass first? And I think that that paradox was by design to, to close ranks of the, the New York City press corps. Are you serious? You need a press pass to cover the live events, but you need to cover the live events to get a press pass? A bit. I mean, I could, I could go to these events. A live event is anything with like, you know, police barricades, you know, court counts. But Does to get Taylor past Swift the- concert count? Do- well, you, it's funny you say that because yeah. we had briefly wondered whether uh, Tyler should attend uh, would be Reagan assassin uh, John Hinckley's concert, but it was canceled. <laughs> God. Which, as you can imagine, I mean, you I weren't was- going to do that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely was. I was like, you know, two birds, one stone. I, I have to see <laughs> his his famous second act. As you can imagine, in Brooklyn, it was probably going to be pretty well attended. <laughs> he was also, I think, this would have been another draw. He was selling his cat paintings at the merch table, but unfortunately, it was canceled last minute. So, if anyone knows of a, a another concert I can cover in New York, please drop it in the comments. I was also going to cover the um, the Chelsea Manning DJ set in Brooklyn, but unfortunately, the t- <laughs> tickets were a little out of budget. If you can believe it. I, I think Lawfare should should do a new vertical where we just send we just send Tyler to very esoteric, barely national security related pop culture events. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Rational Security. We are still Scottless. Uh, I am Quinta Jurassic. I'm here with my co-host Ellen Rosenstein. Hello. And we have not one, but two special guests, at least for our first segment. We have Law Firm Managing Editor Tyler McBrien. Hello. And in the spirit of Scott, I thought you were going to go with a pun and say Scott Free, but Scottless. You know, well, so that's what we need Scott for, because that didn't occur to me at all. Um, that Scott <laughs> well, the is the pun, pun the, master. The pun quality on this show has it's, it's entered a steep yeah, decline. Um, and of course, we also have the one and only Dan Byman here to talk us through the Moscow terror attack. Hi, hi, Dan. Hello. Thanks for having me on. It's always nice to have you come on and talk about cheerful, happy things. Yeah, and because I have a sunny disposition, my wife said it's kind of like hearing a terrorism briefing from a golden doodle. Uh, <laughs> so it's um, you know I picked an odd line of work for my personality. I think. Well, I think we have our episode title. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Actually, honestly, that's like a that's that's actually very accurate. Actually, because you do you do have you do have such a pleasant like you have an extreme, extremely pleasant affect. Oh my god! All right. <laughs> That's so good. Well, I think we do have our episode title. Uh, so listeners, welcome to the uh, terrorism briefing from a golden doodle edition of Rational Security. <laughs> and as always, we have three topics for you. So first, with Dan, we have our topic on the Moscow attack. On Friday, March 22nd, a group of gunmen unleashed an attack on a concert hall outside Moscow that killed over 130 people, shooting into a crowd of concert goers before setting the hall on fire. The Islamic State in Khorasan, the Afghanistan branch of ISIS, known as ISIS-K, claimed credit for the attack, and Russian authorities have arrested and apparently brutalized four suspects. But the Kremlin, without evidence, has also continued to hint that Ukraine is somehow responsible. What does the attack tell us about ISIS-K, and what does it mean for the Russian government? We're doing musical themes for our next few titles, because in Scott's absence, we're really struggling pun-wise. So, next topic, April come she will. After a brief delay, Donald Trump's hush money trial in Manhattan has been scheduled to begin on April 15th, the first of Trump's criminal cases to go to trial. Meanwhile, a New York appeals court threw Trump a lifeline, reducing his appeal bond in the civil fraud case against him from a whopping half a billion dollars to a piddly $175 million. Will old Donnie Trump be able to wriggle out of this jam once again? And last topic, come on, Eileen. Do you need me to sing it? 
Do you need me go to for sing it, it, please? Come on, Eileen. There you go. I don't know the rest of the. I don't know the rest I, of the I song. actually listened to it in preparation for this and determined that I would not be singing. So thank you, Alan. That was a bit a bit of a jazzy rendition, Alan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a cover. You, you gave it some swing. It's an yeah. acapella cover. By Come Alan. on, Eileen. <laughs> Judge Eileen Cannon is at it again down in Fort Pierce, Florida. As she presides over Trump's classified documents case, motions are piling up on her desk without any sign of a ruling, and she issued a strange convoluted order instructing both parties to, quote, engage with, end quote, potential jury instructions reflecting unusual readings of the Presidential Records Act in relation to the Espionage Act. Just what is Judge Cannon doing, and how, if at all, can Jack Smith respond? So for our first topic on Moscow, Alan, I will hand it over to you. So there's a lot to talk about, and we have an expert here with us. So I'm just going to go straight to asking Dan a bunch of questions. So Dan, let's take this horrifying attack sort of in its different pieces. And let's start with the perpetrators, the Islamic State of Khorasan, or ISIS-K. So who are they? Um, Have we heard about them before? And why now? So ISIS-K formally announces itself in 2015. And we'll all recall that at that time, the Islamic State, the one based in Iraq and Syria that had declared a caliphate, uh, that had really grabbed world attention. And it excited the broader jihadist community as well. And this had two effects. Uh, One is that a lot of people were just excited about the ideology, excited about the caliphate. But the other was that when you have divisions within groups, you have some people who are disaffected who seize on a new cause and say, that's what we're about really as a power struggle. So in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, which is, if you want to use kind of ancient terms, what Islamists would refer to as Khorasan, uh, you had jihadists there who said, we don't like the Taliban and we're dissatisfied with some of the other groups. We're going to latch on to this Islamic state label and we like its ideology. And so it was a way of both putting forward a new message, but also challenging an old one. The group, for most of its history, was really focused on that area, on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and was largely seen as a regional group, even though it had ties to the Islamic State, which was a global group, or at least had global ambitions. So Part of why the Moscow attack is of such concern is not only the horrific death count in Russia itself, but also because it may suggest that this group is going beyond a local regional threat to um, a much broader one, possibly including Europe, possibly even including the United States. So those are some of the concerns. So why is ISIS-K attacking Russia? What, what What is the beef here? You can think of this as having three different components. Uh, For the broader jihadist movement, uh, Russia has always been, if not at the center of the stage, at least close to it. So going back to the 1980s, which in the jihadist world is kind of ancient history, uh, the anti-Soviet struggle was really the core of what brought this movement together. In the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the number one cause for many years was actually Chechnya. And if you look at the 9-11 plot itself, um, a number of the attackers were motivated to join up with the jihadist world uh, because they were upset by Chechnya. So Russia's you know, very strong in general. Um, switching over to the mother organization, the Islamic State itself, Russia actively backed the Syrian regime, actively worked with Iran um, against the Islamic State and other groups in Syria. So the number one project for the Islamic State, the caliphate, Russia was actively trying to fight. And a lot of the rank and file of the Islamic State, uh, they had plenty of people from the Caucasus and from Central Asia who brought with them a lot of anger at Russia. Switching over to ISIS-K itself, it has this heritage, it has these ties to the Islamic State, but it also uses Russia as a way to criticize the Taliban. The Taliban, by comparison with ISIS-K, is more moderate, and the Taliban have been trying to have relations with major powers, including Russia. And ISIS-K is saying, you know, look, these people are negotiating with Russia. They're establishing diplomatic ties. We're the ones fighting. So it's using terrorism as a form of criticizing its rival and advertising for its own cause. So now let's turn to the attack itself. Obviously, any attack is an intelligence failure on the part of the country being attacked. But 
Some intelligence failures are worse than others. Sometimes countries just get unlucky. And sometimes there really is just a catastrophic failure. You know, obviously the information is still sketchy. It's very hard to credit anything coming out of Russia. And we'll talk later about just the sheer number of lies that the Russian authorities are, are saying and trying to spin this. But, you know, based on what we know now, how much of an intelligence failure does this, or a security failure perhaps, does this attack suggest on the part of, of Russian authorities? So, you know, with the appropriate caveats of there's a lot we don't know, it does seem to be a pretty striking failure. And I actually like the term security failure because I think that's broader and covers a lot. The United States seems to have warned Russia that an attack was imminent and even said it might involve something like a concert hall, right? So unusually specific and accurate information was presented. In addition, European states had been arresting suspects that seemed to have uh, Central Asian links, links to ISIS-K. You had a um, senior U.S. military official, General Kurilla, who had testified and said, hey, this group seems to be more ambitious. We're worried about broader attacks. So from a U.S. point of view, there was a lot of information saying there's more going on. And at least some of that seems to have been conveyed to Russia. I, I don't know any of the specifics, of course. And ideally, that information gives enough to identify and arrest potential perpetrators. But at the very least, you'd expect more security measures. And that doesn't seem to have been done. And in fact, when the U.S. gave a public warning to its own citizens because it seemed Russia wasn't acting, uh, Russia dismissed it saying, hey, you're trying to scare Russians. This is just an information op by the United States. So I think there was a significant security failure. Um, without details, it's hard to know how bad, but certainly the initial indicators seem to suggest Moscow really bungled this one. I mean, it's also notable that that these gunmen were able to you know, shoot up a concert hall, light it on fire, escape and drive some several hundred miles away, I think almost to the sort of Ukraine-Belarus border before they were uh, before they were attacked before they were captured, which again doesn't doesn't reflect terribly well on the on the Russian authorities. No, and you know this is always a question of you know yes, Russia is a police state, but is it a poorly run police state? Right. And, you know, we, at least I at times have this image of this mix of kind of, you know, surveillance technology mixed with a heavy armed police presence on and on and on. But here you had, you know, an actual massive um, attack. And the people just seem to have kind of done their thing and moved on uh, with relatively little interference, at least initially. Dan, I'm really glad you're here. I think you're the perfect person because you not only know a lot about terrorism, but also about intelligence and, and, perhaps even intelligence sharing. So I want to go back to the the point about how the United States essentially warned Russia of an imminent attack. There's also reporting to suggest that the United States um, warned Iran ahead of the attack at the Soleimani Memorial. So I, I, I guess I have a sort of almost like Machiavellian question of, of why the United States would, I think some listeners would be wondering why the United States would warn their enemies about an, an imminent attack. Is it the enemy of my enemy? Um, is it you know this this desire to enforce the norm of of interstate conflict rather than rather than non-state terrorism conflict what do you make of that those warnings so the united states policy is what it calls a duty to warn the duty to warn is based on the idea that we are involved in really a struggle of i'll say good versus evil but that there's a basic line between attacks on legitimate targets, which might be military targets, might be, if you want, government very broadly defined. But at the same time, uh, innocent people are innocent people. And that could be innocent people in Iran, it could be innocent people in Russia, it could be innocent people in North Korea. And that when the U.S. is doing military targeting, it tries to think about that. But also when it comes to warning, it recognizes that some targets are off limits, and obviously a concert venue is one of those. So that's U.S. policy, and it's actually nice and idealistic, and it makes me feel good about being an American. Um, this is not, you know, hey, we're at war with Russia, so if their own uh, people get killed, you know, haha, that makes Putin look bad, therefore let it go through. There is a recognition that is in life matters, and I'm glad the U.S. has this policy. I initially saw, in, after news of this attack sort of filtered out, a lot of comparisons to the 1999 Moscow apartment bombings. Um, so for listeners who aren't aware, this was a pretty brutal bombing of uh, residential apartment buildings in Moscow that 
Putin, who was sort of newly in power, used um, as kind of an excuse to really crack down on Chechnya on a incredibly brutal campaign. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories, which may or may not be too conspiratorial about whether or not the state was involved in that. But at the very least, it it uh, used that attack as an excuse. I'm curious, Jen, how you think that compares to to this. My sense has been that it's it seems the vibe seems different for lack of a better word. The initial response from the Kremlin seemed kind of panicky and confused, and it it took them a while to decide who they were going to to blame. I think the sort of optics of having these four men from Tajikistan who do seem like they were um, involved in the plot, um, while also kind of saying like, ah, yes, Ukraine and the United States were involved is kind of confused and and muddled. Would you anticipate that this would be used to sort of justify a crackdown or use of force in any particular direction? So the the comparison is an interesting one because Putin in some ways used those attacks to make his reputation. He seized on the attacks to double down on the war in Chechnya and, and in contrast to previous leaders actually made progress in, in Chechnya, did so brutally. I will say as an aside, I actually believe some of the conspiracy theories that at least part of these were false flag operations. It's a little unclear if all of them were, but at least one seems to have been a uh, false flag operation. Uh, but Yeah, it's it's not a conspiracy theory if they really are out to get you. Yeah, there, there really are conspiracies, right? And so, you know, uh, the conspiracy was real in this case. Um, you know, we have different theories as to why they did it. This one, this problem was so supposed to have been solved, right? Putin was supposed to have, you know, defeated the terrorists in the fundamental sense. And part of his strongman image is he's the one that was able to crush these organizations. Um, and as everyone knows, for the last two years, Russians have been kind of deluged with massive propaganda where everything is related to Ukraine and its Western backers. So to have a problem that was supposed to have been solved resurface, and then to have it in the context of Russia throwing all its resources at a different problem um, is embarrassing. And I think that does create a muddle where there's a lot of, if you will, reality that points to you know, a whether it's ISIS K or more broadly, kind of uh, centrally Asian militancy versus the day to day of Ukraine. And the Russian regime is really having problems kind of dealing with that. They're still trying to do it today, where they're, you know, recently mentioned that, you know, yes, there is this kind of central Asian link, but it's in part a British plot um, and disinformation campaigns uh, linked to that. So I think there's a degree of incoherence that's likely to continue. One thing I've been struck by is the brutal, even by Russian standards, response to the attack, uh, specifically with respect to the four terrorists. The question of whether or not the Russian security forces treat detainees well, or even just not abusively, is a longstanding one. But in the past, when there were allegations of torture, the Russians at least denied it or didn't celebrate it. Here, I mean, you have literal videos of you know, one of the terrorists' ears being cut off and literally fed to him. And Which is not not an exaggeration. No, not an exaggeration. And and then the knife that was used, the the ear cutter knife, as they like to, as they they've been advertising it, sold on auction. Everyone is celebrating this. Uh, I mean, let's put aside the legality and the morality. You know, it's all very bad. Um, what does this say about, for lack of a better term, the, the Russian psyche and the kind of potential uh, increasing brutalization of of that society? There's, can I actually add one one additional point to that? Um, and Dan, I, I am really interested in your your thoughts because one of the sort of interesting threads is that it seems like the Wagner Group was somehow involved in some of this. It, the at least according to the Guardian, the um, photographs of some of the torture of the detainees were published on a Telegram channel linked to Wagner. Um, and then there's also a sort of far right link. So again, this is from a Guardian article that the the officer who cuts off the ear um, of the suspect um, has military patches that include patches worn by SS units. Um, so there's sort of a additional connection to the, I think, increasingly far right turn in the Russian government and sort of associated units. I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how that plays into it. Uh, so this is interesting. And honestly, I didn't uh, realize the potential Wagner connection. So We've all seen this shift 
in Russia in really the last 15 years, where it's embracing much more of a kind of far-right nationalistic ideology. And part of that is in the specifics of what they're pushing, the idea of kind of a a muscular Christian, anti-gay, pro-religion, pro-traditional values uh, set of uh, propaganda, but also more broadly allying more with far-right causes, uh, funding far-right organizations. Um, and we're seeing this within Russia itself, where you have these movements that are, you know, have relationships with the Kremlin, but are not fully controlled by them. And you have a lot of these networks, and these networks are in the security services, they're in the military, um, and they're also showing up in the broader kind of echo chamber. And so, to me, the shift is is part of it. And to go to the kind of torture in particular, that, that honestly was surprising to me. Not that they tortured people, but that they were so you know, openly bragging about it. And what I wonder, and, and, and don't know, but um, what I wonder is how much of it is a way of diverting uh, public opinion and public rage and just saying, you know, yes, I'm sure you're furious at the regime to some degree for failure, but here are the people you should be hating. Right and look, we are the ones who are you know doing what what people in a way want to do after something horrible. Right, it's that you know the wheels of justice are slow and they're meant to present you know a complex picture. And here, people are like, if they're guilty, torture them, then kill them. And the regime is in some ways giving people what they want, um, even if that's you know bad from certainly from my point of view. But I actually think you know bad in the long term sense for what the regime's hoping to accomplish. So Dan, last question for you, which is, so where do we go from here? And in particular, where does Russia go from here? I mean, you have two fronts, it seems. Sort of one is is the actual Central Asian terrorism front. Um, and the question is, you know, does it make sense or, or do you expect Russia to try to do something more proactive in that area to strike back or prevent another attack? And then second, and relatedly, because you can't talk about Russia without talking about the war in Ukraine. What does this mean for the war in Ukraine? Right? You could imagine the Russians pulling back from the war in Ukraine to focus on some other security issues. That seems unlikely. You could imagine the Russians doubling down because Putin needs to, dis again, distract his populace. I'm just curious how you think all those dynamics are going to play out. So there's not much Russia can do against ISIS-K. Um, ISIS-K is largely kind of buried in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's hunted by security services of Pakistan, but especially by the Taliban in Afghanistan. You know, Russia conceivably could do, you know, a special operations raid. It could do some sort of, you know, standoff strike. But that's not going to really change the dynamics of ISIS-K too much. Um, it might be more active going after the Central Asian or Caucasian population within Russia itself. And increase a series of security measures, you know, be more brutal, be more restrictive. And that to me seems, you know, fairly likely, unfortunately. Um, so my bet would be they try to do something high profile, but that actually doesn't move the needle much, right? So they can say, you know, look, we're striking back against those who hit us. And they do what mostly what they're going to do anyway in Ukraine, but now they add another reason to the propaganda that the Ukrainians facilitated this terrorist attack. Um, so I think there'll be some noise, but my guess is it's not going to dramatically change Russia's policy towards Ukraine or, for that matter, its approach in Afghanistan and Pakistan, with the big exception being how it treats its own Muslim population, which has always been pretty poor and may get worse. Well, Dan, uh, we'll let you go. Thanks for coming on and talking uh, to us about this issue. My pleasure. Well, from, from Putin to uh, Putin's biggest fan, Tyler, you were in the courtroom this past week when Justice Juan Merchan scheduled Trump's trial to begin on April 15th, the Ides of April, one might say. Uh, what, what was it like in the, in the courtroom? Give us your insider's take. I guess you weren't in the courtroom, in the courthouse. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was back at 100 Center Street on Monday, which was March 25th. If you recall, back on February 15th, I was at another hearing, actually in the courtroom that time, uh, seated at the back row, uh, but still had a line of sight to the former president himself, that it looked like we had a trial on March 25th. As announced by Justice Merchan back on the 15th, he called it, quote, a date certain, but it turned out to be not so certain after we had some late breaking 
uh, discovery news from the Southern District, District of New York, which uh, had, it turns out, produced tens of thousands of documents um, to the district attorney's office, who then uh, availed those same documents to the defense. And, and can you remind us just which which trial we're talking about? I like yes. honestly, <laughs> I like legit, I legitimately li- like this is theoretically <laughs> my job, and I cannot keep track of this dude's trials. The SDNY documents go back to another criminal oh, case. My God. What's confusing about four different jurisdictions, four different <laughs> fact patterns? Four different, um, it's the Let's same go. defendant. No, yeah, there are also right. many different defendants as well. The but, embarrassment um, of riches. Right. To recap, this is the this is the first indictment brought against the former president related to the so-called hush money, or related to the hush money payments um, paid to Stormy Daniels in 2016 in the run-up to the election. Um, the hush money payments, a hush money payment is is not uh, you know in itself illegal, but this was tied to allegations of, of the falsifying of business records to to cover up for the repayment to Michael Cohen. Uh, and then the DA has also um, bumped it up to a felony by claiming that this is um, also a violation of election law. Um, so in my, if my retelling was a bit muddled, I think that is um, my failing as well as a, a bit of a, a tortured fact pattern for this case, uh, as, as many people have pointed out. Um, so back to the, the hearing on Monday, we were there uh, because both sides actually had agreed to a, a brief adjournment to have enough time to review these tens of thousands of documents that had had just come in from from the Southern District. The defense wanted a 90-day adjournment as well as um, another motion to dismiss. The, the prosecutors pushed instead for a 30-day adjournment, um, which is what we got. And so instead of uh, the jury selection starting on March 25th, we had another pre-trial hearing. Um, at this hearing, I would say in contrast to the last hearing, Justice Marchand was a lot less patient, I think, with with Trump's lawyers. We can get into to that a, a bit more. Uh, but the upshot is that it seems we will have a trial beginning on April 15th. Um, there's still, uh, I think, one more matter probably left before the trial, which is another motion to dismiss, after which the right now we're waiting for a response from the people, but it doesn't seem like that will succeed. So reading your write-up with uh, the one and only associate editor, Catherine Pompilio Tyler, I was really struck by how, uh, for lack of a better word, done Merchan seemed with Trump's counsel. Um, he was pretty, I don't know, snippy is too harsh, but he was, out, he was out not of fucks, amused. Quinta. That's the technical term. <laughs> he is just out of fucks. Yeah, he, he, he has was, no more fucks to give. He was not there for, for uh, he was not picking up what they were putting down. Was that was that the vibe of watching it live? Yes, I, I mean he was firm. I, there were some similarities to, to the last hearing I went to on February fifteenth. Both times he w- was exhausted at, at Blanche beating a dead horse, which was funny. In this hearing, Blanche said I think twice not to beat a dead horse, and then proceeded to beat said horse. But I think. Merchan seemed a bit exhausted with Blanche specifically bringing up things that he had already brought up in the filings, uh, things that were already settled. Almost every time Justice Merchan cut off uh, Blanche specifically, he would say something like, tell me something I haven't heard before. What's new about this? This isn't new. We've heard this before. This isn't a legal argument, (laughs) things of that nature. So uh, I think Justice Merchan has a reputation for being extremely calm and collected. I wouldn't say he lost his cool, but he was quite firm. He didn't have negative fucks, but he had no fucks, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it turns out that systematically (laughs) aggravating the judge who is hearing your case is maybe not actually the best way to go about but but it right. does feel like that is like the trump litigation strategy across a variety of Ex- except you know. in I will fulton say, county anna bauer would point yeah, well, out if she were here they, they are good they are good in that case i will say that i think this was definitely a continuation of the overall delay strategy but one point in which it seemed that blanche crossed the line or at least the you know, Trump's defense team crossed the line. And even Blanche seemed to realize he crossed the line here was in suggesting in one of the the motions that Justice Merchant himself was complicit in the alleged prosecutorial misconduct on the side of the DA. Merchant brought that up immediately. He, he basically said it was the purpose of the hearing to both address that complicity, but more so these very serious allegations of prosecutorial misconduct. And he, he dispensed with them 
pretty quickly. You know, his 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 ruling at from the bench at the end was that was that there there was no there is no prosecutorial misconduct on on the side of the DA and and hence no no complicity either on on his side. Yeah, I think honestly, after reading your write up and looking at the filings, this seems like a the the issue with the documents being produced seems to be like a good old issue of the feds and thinking that they're better than state prosecutors and don't need to give them the time of day. Sorry to the U.S. Attorney's Office for SDNY, but everyone listening to this knows that is the truth. They literally call themselves the Sovereign District of New York, so it does not surprise me that they took their sweet time in handing over these materials, which of course stem from the prosecution of Michael Cohen on the same basis for which Trump is now being prosecuted in New York because time is a flat circle and we just go around and around on these Trump scandals. The, the eternal, the Nietzschean eternal return exactly, of Trump litigation. Exactly. <laughs> I, I will say if I would not choose to do it the same way over again <laughs> were I given the well, opportunity. The, you, you are not the Ubermensch. I, I mean, I feel like that's, we can all, or Ubermensch, we, we, we must yeah. conclude, right? Quinta, I will say, had you been sitting in the back of the courtroom you probably would have shouted bingo because we touched <laughs> on everything. We hit Mueller investigation. We hit Russia. We hit, you know, Michael Cohen. It was, it was. Uh, that did warm my little heart when I said right. that in the, in the transcript. So while I was in criminal court, unfortunately, I didn't have time to, to pay close attention to what was happening in civil court. Um, so Quinton Allen, I'm curious if you've been following the, the issue of the bond and the, the shrinking of, of the, you know, of the amount to a mere, as you said, $175 million. Yeah, I mean, it's so okay. First off, I should say I'm hesitant to like comment on this too, with too much confidence, because I think that one of the things that the New York cases have been plagued with from the beginning, as with the Georgia cases, is uh, people who either write about or practice federal law kind of parachuting in and declaring confidently how state law works without actually knowing and the New York courts are uh, famously Byzantine and complicated. And so I want to begin with a a note of humility <laughs> that there is there is much that I do not know about how uh New York courts think about this issue of appellate bonds. That said, my impression just from reading commentary is that people who have practiced in New York and have, you know, dealt with these kinds of cases were pretty surprised that Trump was able to get a stay from the appeals court that they hadn't expected it. I did do a little bit of poking around in the New York code, and my understanding is that the standard for a stay is the basically the same as the standard for a federal injunction. Um, so one of the factors has to do with a potential irreparable injury to the party who's asking for the stay if, if the judgment is not um, stayed or enjoined. And again, note of humility, tell me if I'm wrong, listeners, after looking around a bit and, and having some conversations, my sense is that the court's reasoning may have been, and I should also say, we don't know, the reasoning wasn't sent out um, in this ruling. My understanding is that that is typical for rulings from uh, New York appeals courts, at least in the first department on these kinds of issues. It's not, they just don't tell you why they're doing things is that part of it may have to do with the fact that a lot of Trump's net worth is bound up in real estate. And so if that real estate is seized by the attorney general, or if Trump has to liquidate it in a fire sale, that he then wouldn't either wouldn't be able to get it back for the same amount of money, or he would be left with an amount of money that is far less than it is arguably worth because he would be selling it off under, you know, sort of extenuating circumstances. Can, you can kind of see the logic of that. My only concern with that is that that everything I just said makes sense to me, except that you then end up with an outcome where if you do a fraud that's big enough with assets <laughs> that are illiquid, you can delay the judgment on your massive fraud, which just seems like it can't be right. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting. That's an that's I, I look. I think that's a fair complaint. But I think you have to remember the, the sort of the posture of this case or the posture of the situation, right? You, you have a judgment, then you have seizure, right? But this has all been happening over a period of weeks or months, right? I, I you know, I, I think the zooming out from this case, zooming out from Trump, zooming out from all of this, right? The the law does likes to take its time. Like the law would prefer to take its time and get things done right than do things extremely quickly. And and so yes, while I agree with you, Quinta, that there's a little bit of a moral hazard or a kind of perversity that that um, you know just because of the nature of the assets you have, uh, you can get more favorable treatment. 
I don't think it is crazy, um, you know, despite as much as, you know, how, how much I would love to see Trump bankrupt. I don't think it's crazy to say, look, you know, this is a really big ruling. This is a really big, big, big verdict. Who knows if it'll stand up fully on appeal? Um, there really is potential for irreparable harm. And whether or not this gets done, you know, whether or not his assets get seized now or six months or a year from now, does it matter that much in the perspective of justice, right? Given that we also don't want to do irreparable harm to a defendant. And and I think, you know, the thing you said, Quinta, at the top of your comments, which was we have to be always be very careful to try to step back from the specific case at hand and in particular the political dynamics, right? There's something a little bit unseemly with everyone getting angry at courts for not, you know, throwing the hammer at Trump soon enough for it to affect the election. Um, and there's always that sort of unspoken thing that, that you know, people who don't like Trump want. And, and I'm very sympathetic. I understand that urge, right? I understand that urge. You know, the, the Mueller report wasn't able to get him. Impeachment wasn't able to get him. You know, he has a 50-50 chance with Biden. He's the Republican front runner. You know, maybe, God, maybe 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 the courts can, can solve this problem for us. Um, but I do think it's really important to be really disciplined and a step back from that. Now, one thing to argue against myself for a moment is one thing that also has happened very recently is that Truth Social um, has gone public. So Truth Social is, of course, the largely unsuccessful, quite small, crappy social network that uh, Trump uh, started. Um, the only thing it has going for it is the very clever, in a Norwellian sense, idea of you truth things, which, of course, on Truth Social is mostly lying. It's really good. I have to say, you, you got to you gotta hand it to him. That was good. And then now, you can retruth, which is... You, you can retruth, which is... There's another layer there. Which is, which is great. If you disagree, it's called alternate truthing. It's not, but it should be. So the IPO did extremely well. You know, it didn't, you know, it came down from the highs of the first day of trading, but it still leaves the company valued at around like $12 billion. And because Trump has a huge stake in Truth Social, he is now, you know, four and a half billion dollars. That, 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 is, that is the value of his stake in the company. Now, a lot of kind of business people and analysts are extremely confused as to how in the world Truth Social could possibly be valued at $12 billion. It's a tiny platform. It has 500,000 active users, which is literally nothing. Um, it does not have good advertising revenue. Its infrastructure is crap. So it does seem to be that this is currently being sort of, maybe artificially is not quite the right word because, you know, things are worth whatever the market says they are, but it's being, it's being propped up by people's support for Trump and their desire to help him, not so much their valuation of the company itself. So, you know, who knows how long that four and a half billion dollar stake of Trump's will last. I do wonder, though, and again, I, I'm not, you know, a, I, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert in this at all, but Trump is a lot richer uh, now than he was a few days ago. And it's a lot easier to sell a bunch of stock than it is to liquidate a bunch of skyscrapers. So I don't know, maybe maybe this has all changed now. Yeah. So a couple a couple points. So first, again, uh, I'm I will cite here to someone who actually practices law in the first department in New York. Um, who how, re how refreshing. I know. Uh, who indicated that so the the schedule um, from the first division appellate court in New York um, is such that they'll go, they're going to hear argument um, on Trump's appeal of the civil judgment in September and that they'll likely have a opinion within the month. So we will find out what happens, right? This is only a stay. It's not overturning the judgment. Are, are you saying we're going to get into what, what did you what did the 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 chasm black hole, of political yeah. doom? The <laughs> I don't. Of political I mean, I don't doom? know, right? Maybe they could they could <laughs> decrease the the judgment. It seems like yeah. that maybe what they were thinking in in staying it. It's really hard to say. So the second point is he still does have to come up with 175 million uh, for the bond. It seems like. Probably more than that if he wants to use a bond company. The estimates that I saw suggested that he probably needs to pony up around $200 million. I think there's a big question about whether or not he has that on hand, given that he posted or he he pledged $100 million in collateral, according to the New York Times, for the bond in the Carroll judgment, which was $92 million. This is well, so much And money. he's going to defame her 10 more times I, right, in exactly, the next week. Exactly. I mean, this guy can't Collateral stop. estoppel, baby. Let's go. It's amazing. Uh, and so, so I think, you know, we have 10 days from when the appeals court ruled to actually see, so 10 days from Monday, to see whether or not he's able to come up with this $175 million, which I don't think is a, is a given, in part because, Alan, to your point, 
I should say, I do not understand SPACs. I try to stay away from them. I have avoided the truth social story. It's confusing to me. I don't like it. It upsets me. Um, <laughs> but my understanding from people who do know this kind of thing is that the problem now is that Trump has all of this money in his stock, but the stock has value because what the company is selling is that Trump owns it. So if he then tries to sell the stock to get the cash to pay the bond, then the value of the stock will plummet, thus creating a, a sort of problem where he is very rich, but only so long as he doesn't he doesn't actually use that stock to do anything. All of this is hypothetical. I do not know if that is how it will work, but I think that is important to keep in mind. Also, he so he's he is prohibited under the terms of the this merger, the SPAC merger, uh, from selling the stock for six months. Um, in what I have learned is called a lockup agreement, um, unless the board approves otherwise, which I imagine they would because they're all his people anyway. Um, so, but there is that kind of additional hurdle. It would be funny if Truth Social ends up just as a giant pump and dump scheme. Isn't that exactly what it is? Yeah, I mean, Drew, it does, Drew, it does, it yeah. does seem Drew to be Hartwell that. in the Washington Post, who's a tech reporter, has been doing really, really good reporting about Truth Social. And like, there's this weird thing where some of the people who first came up with the idea are suing Trump over it because they say that he bilked them out of a lot of the value of the company. It the whole th it's it's built on a, a code from Mastodon, which is open source. But the, the whole thing is just weird as hell. I, I think, it, I mean, it would be funnier if this turned out not to be a pump and dump. <laughs> there was like some actual value to this company, but. Surprise. Yeah, it's the first company that's actually figured out how to make social media, you know, turn turn a, a quick profit rather than <laughs> just losing money. We got to start, Locker's got to start its own social media company. Never. One question I had you know, as we kind of think about the case itself, and maybe this will become clearer once the trial actually starts, and certainly once we have a verdict, is how important is this case? I mean, I think everyone recognizes, even the people who think this is a legitimate case, that this is like hardly Trump's greatest sin. Like, this is not why Trump is a threat to American democracy, right? But, you know, it is what it is. And because of a, a variety of wild events, including one we'll talk about in the next segment with respect to the uh, to the Florida documents case. This is the case that's coming first, right? For for better or for worse, you know how how are you all thinking about what this case will mean more broadly? And let's just talk about Trump's political standing, because I mean I think that's kind of the most obvious question to to ask. You know, one thing that's I've been really struck by in in the polling around Trump and around the Republican nomination is the number of people who who voted for Trump in the various primaries, but then said something like, if Trump is convicted of a felony, they would not support him. Okay. I mean, it's hard to know what exactly to think about that question. You know, people are thinking about a hypothetical here. It's also, you know, are all felonies the equal, right? I mean, I think it's a kind of a big difference if Trump is convicted for trying to overthrow the 2020 election than he is for falsifying business records to pay off a porn star. So I'm just curious how, how you're all thinking about, you know, this trial in, in those contexts. Yeah, I mean, look, I will say I have always been kind of a cheerleader for the the importance of the Stormy Daniels issue, which is separate from the specific way that Bragg has brought the case. But I mean, look, like I, I'll, I'll just I'll pat myself on the back. I wrote a couple articles with Bob Bauer and Lawfare back in the day when all this was first unfolding when we were learning about it, arguing that um, Making this hush money agreement with Stormy Daniels and then covering it up, including when he was in the White House, constituted an impeachable offense. And uh, I went back and looked and I published an article in The Atlantic when Trump was first charged. And the title of it is This is Actually Quite Bad, <laughs> which I think is a pretty good. <laughs> I did not come up with that title. Thank you to my editor. But I think it's a pretty good expression of how I feel about it. I mean, I think that it, what Trump is alleged to have done here is paid money to cover up a piece of negative information about himself violating campaign finance laws in the process in order to deprive the public of relevant information about the character of the person they were choosing to be the president. And then 
continued to lie and pay back that money and continue that campaign finance violation, at least under federal law, well into his time in office. I believe the last check was cut in December 2017, I want to say. Um, I think that speaks directly to who he is as a person and what kind of leader he is. I think you can draw a pretty straight line between that and the sort of willingness to engage in shenanigans around election integrity in 2016 and 2020 and what we're now seeing in in 2024 and sort of, you know, do anything to win. And I also, and this is a thought that this is something I, I have been meaning to flesh out more. If you read the documents in the New York case, one thing that is worth reminding ourselves is just how tightly this whole thing is tied to the Access Hollywood tape. And what I mean by that is that Trump, according to prosecutors, what happens is basically Stormy Daniels comes forward and says, hey, I would like somebody to not talk about my relationship with you. Trump says, yeah, 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 sure. They delay it on the grounds that we can just push it past the election and then it doesn't matter. Like they're not actually planning on paying her. Then the Access Hollywood tape drops. And then immediately after Trump and Cohen, again, according to prosecutors, are like, oh, no, we actually really need to pay her. And then it kind of unspools from there. And so I think this is also relevant to the extent that a lot of Trump's appeal is this kind of posturing of masculinity and of a freedom to treat women poorly um, that was on display in the Access Hollywood tape um, that he kind of got a pass for and that he won the election. Um, And so I think it is relevant in that sense, too. It has directly has to do with his treatment of women. Um, Now, does any of that mean that he is criminally liable for uh, misrepresenting his finances and business records? Not necessarily, no. But I do think it is it is important to keep in mind when we're thinking about this case. Like, I actually don't think it's as sort of piddly and insubstantial as, as many people claim. Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it is a great political counterfactual. And that has hung over the hearings I've attended so far that the implication exactly what you said, where, you know, it had the, the Stormy Daniels news come out at the same time as Access Hollywood, would that have tipped, you know, public favor sufficiently against Trump that he wouldn't have won the election in the, fir- in the first place in 2016? It's a great question. Again, you know, if it, it, it's not not really a legal one, so you know, we're not. I'm not sure, but I think it does give this case more weight. Everyone agrees it's important. I think, but you know, whether or not it's only important because it may be the only case going to trial before the election, I, I think I think it's it's more important than that. And then, Alan, to your point about the the same this polling, I've also been thinking about it. You know, his how many you know points of support he drops after being convicted of a felony, if he's convicted of a felony. Uh, I agree, not all felonies are the same, and I think not all jurisdictions and um, impressions of who's bringing the case against him are the same. So I think a lot of parts of this case, you know, wouldn't deter. Trump supporters. So it's it's in New York. He 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 can't get a fair you know jury in Manhattan because they're all libs. <laughs> um, it's it's brought by a. He did say um, he wanted to move the trial to Staten Island. Right, <laughs> exactly. And and you know it's it's brought by a, um, a a DA, a black DA, which who may be seen as illegitimate to to some Trump supporters. So I I I, I agree that it's 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 right to question you know. It's right to disaggregate that that polling into like which felony, which case, et cetera. And I, I don't know if this one moves the needle as much as others uh, if he is convicted. Well, from going from a case that is about to happen in a matter of weeks to a case that may never happen, may happen at some point, who knows, throwing up my hands here. Um, last week, we had a hearing down in Fort Pierce in Judge Eileen Cannon's courtroom uh, to discuss two different motions for dismissal. The first one was uh, uh, regarding a statute uh, in the Espionage Act in which um, Trump argued that it was unconstitutionally vague, that around the around the, the meaning of unauthorized possession, that one we can set aside because um, Judge Cannon dismissed it. The other uh, she has yet to rule on the merits. Um, this one is regarding uh, Trump's interpretation of the Presidential Records Act, which, in in his telling, uh, this is a, an interpretation we've heard before, was that essentially he was allowed to retain the documents at Mar-a-Lago by deeming them personal documents rather than you know, the the property of of the federal government. Instead of ruling on that one, she instead issued a bit of a head scratcher order, asking 
or rather ordering both sides to issue jury instructions based on these two differing interpretations of the PRA. So I, I want to end there and I want to I want to go to to Quinta first. As many people have read, legal ex- experts are are scratching their heads at this. There seems to be a bit of a cart before the horse element. Could it be interpreted that <laughs> that Judge Cannon uh, just approaches the law like jazz? She's she's a bit of a of a maverick. She's she's the Miles Davis of, of federal judges. Or wow, is there something <laughs> something to be said uh, here for uh, you know the confusion surrounding this order? What do you make? I, of I just Quinta? I just have an image of of that scene in Anchorman where where he he plays jazz flute. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a there's a jazz flute hidden up her her large uh, you know judge sleeve. Okay, sorry, Quinta, to you. <laughs> well, now <laughs> I don't know, man. I Alan, you you are the only one of us who has practiced law. I yeah. I read this order and I could not figure out what she was asking them to do. And my impression from seeing a lot of lawyers post about it on social media is that no one has ever seen an order like this. So what she's what she's asking them to do is she's asking the parties to engage with potential jury instructions having to do with the legal interpretation, not typically a matter of the jury, matter for the jury, of the Presidential Records Act in relation to the Espionage Act, which is basically like the so the second option is essentially can Trump declassify things based on vibes. Um <laughs> I, I, I mean, I've just never seen anything like this. Like, I haven't even seen a good version of an order like this. H- have you, Alan? I, I have not. This is this is extremely weird. I mean, it's weird. It's, so it's weird. weird. It's a weird across a, a number of dimensions, right? So first, it's weird from the timing perspective. Like, why would you start asking people to draft jury instructions when there are so many other things to deal with, including basic questions like, what is the law that applies? To why are you potentially asking juries to opine on these legal questions? And third, this isn't that hard of a legal question. Like the Presidential Records Act and the issue of classified information are just, they're, they're different issues. The Presidential Records Act is about, the you know, the president throughout the course of the presidency creates a bunch of records, the vast majority of which are unclassified, right? They're just like the random records of the White House and they're supposed to go to the archive. Well, so it, it's weird in two ways, right? So first, um, so first it has nothing to do with classified information. And second, the point of the Presidential Records Act was largely to make the president give more stuff back to the government, not to encourage the president to keep stuff. Now, it is true that the Presidential Records Act allows the president to keep stuff, but the whole idea is the president has to specifically state what he's keeping. But he's keeping stuff as personal stuff. He's not keeping stuff as declassified stuff. They're just totally separate issues. So you, you have like a, 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 a bunch of, of weirdnesses. And you know the, the problem, the, kind of the, 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 the meta problem with all of this and the meta problem with covering Eileen Cannon, who honestly, it's, I was going to say covering the case, but honestly, we're, there's nothing that interesting about this case anymore. The, covering the case is just covering Eileen Cannon. Like, she has violated one of the key rules of being a judge, which is making yourself the story. Um, like, the Cannon is so much more interesting than the case itself at this point. Is district court judges have an enormous amount of discretion in how they run their cases. And that discretion is both a matter of kind of culture and tradition, but it's also because running, you know, every case is different and you, you really just do need at some point to give a lot of day-to-day power to the judge. Because of that, you know, any one particular weird decision that Canon makes, you could probably explain away. And this is a somewhat sui generis case just because of the nature of the defendant. So I think one would always expect there to be some weirdnesses. But the problem is you stack like decision after decision after decision after decision together. And it's just, it's a very weird layer cake of badness. First, I will say no one understood Miles Davis at first when he started uh, doing his thing. But no, she's uh, ahead and, of and her I, time. And, <laughs> and I think it may have been Miles Davis uh, who famously said, maybe it was Charlie Parker, but you know, it was one of the greats who said, if you play the wrong note, just play it again, louder. And that honestly <laughs> a great point. feels like but what Cannon's judicial or ju- judicial philosophy. Miles is. Davis could not be reversed by the Eleventh Circuit. <laughs> exactly. Well, I guess. I, but my real question was: you mentioned that a lot of these orders can be explained in some way. What is there? Is there a generous interpretation of this specific order, or is this just the weirdest one we've seen? I don't think this is. I don't it, think so. I mean, I. Ch- challenge accepted. I-, I can devil's advocate. Well, anything. Can, okay, can and, I can and... I set out my case first, and oh, then you okay, can devil's okay, advocate okay. me. <sighs> okay, there are two versions of Judge Cannon that I want to argue against. 
There is one where she is like a good faith actor just doing her best and we're all just bringing her down. She's ahead of her time. We don't appreciate her. There's another where she is an evil genius, super hack, who is doing everything to make things easy for Trump. And I don't think that either of those is right. And the reason is that, so on the first thing, some of the stuff she's doing is just like so weird that it does just does not strike me as the behavior of an honest broker. And what I mean by that is stuff like this bizarre order about jury instructions, which, by the way, I, it's worth setting out. Our uh, law for colleague Roger Parloff has written and podcasted about this and has a great explanation that's more cogent than anything I can offer. The the, ver- the questions about the Presidential Records Act that Cannon is raising here are basically based on a single aside in a hearing before a D.C. district judge over a request by Judicial Watch to get a hold of some records from the Clint from Bill Clinton. Um, this there is not like this is like fantasy law. This is not real law. But she's taking it seriously, and no one's ever like. I don't know what kind of an order this is. So that's, I don't think she is an honest broker. Um, Or I don't think she's, if she's trying to play it straight down the middle, she's not very good at it. That leads to my second point, which is that if she was an evil genius, like, I just don't think she would be making all of these weirdo orders. Like, if you, if you're a district judge and you really just want to screw the government, there are a lot of things you can do, right? You can set things up so that it's impossible for the government to, you know, you can uh, impanel the jury and then so double double jeopardy attaches and, you know, then take your evil genius action so the the government can't bring the case again, right? There are all kinds of clever, clever things you could do. She's not really doing those. She's just doing weird stuff, Um, which leads me to feel that, A, she is not very good at her job. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, she can't write. Also, that's another thing. Like the order, it, it is incomprehensible. It she cannot write a sentence. Um, she's just not very good at her job, and I think is yeah, like scared of Trump, wants to help him out, is bending over backward for whatever reason. I don't know, um, but clearly she has a bias in his direction, and yet is sort of not quite clever enough to figure out how to rule for him smoothly. Um, in a way that doesn't attract attention and potentially the ire of the 11th Circuit. So, Alan, tell me why I'm wrong. Yeah, I, No, you're not wrong at all. I mean, to be clear, when I said that I can devil's advocate this, it was I can devil's advocate that she's not a wholly bad faith actor. I can't devil's advocate that this makes sense. I mean, you know, I, I think the best thing you can say is that and I think, you know, David Latt, um, who, who writes a great Substack uh, about all things legal, has had this really good reporting sort of really thinking in, I think, a very generous but still critical way about Eileen Cannon. You know, I think she's overwhelmed. She seems to panic r- really easily, which is which is not great. Um, you know, we think we've all been in a situation, right, where we sort of freak out and start flailing. We've all been there. It's just ideally you're not there when you're a district court judge overseeing a really important case. But she she seems to kind of flail and panic and just like try at random stuff. And and she's also kind of has the she has the mind of an appellate lawyer and an appellate judge rather than a district court judge. And what I mean by that is, you know. In in the judicial hierarchy and also in judicial prestige, appellate judges are, quote unquote, higher than district court judges, right? That's kind of the nature of the thing. But I've actually always thought that the job of a district court judge is actually much harder and much more complicated than, than the job of an appellate judge. Because an appellate judge can kind of sit there and just kind of like ask abstract legal questions, and that's fine. Um, but a district court judge has to like run cases. That's actually very, very difficult. I, I think that, that um, you know, Canon is, is in a position where she's sort of She's kind of panicking a lot. She's not very good at running cases. She maybe finds all these legal issues kind of interesting and wants to sort of think about them deeply. And so is like, oh, maybe maybe it'd be interesting for me to ask the litigants what their jury instructions would be. Maybe that would be useful to me in some like abstract sense. Um, That's the best case version I can imagine. But it doesn't end well for anybody. You know, that and the fact that, and there's more reporting from David Latt, that, you know, there seems to be a lot of chaos in her chambers. She has clerks quitting, some for maybe normal reasons, but some for, you know, reasons based on the the workplace environment. You, You just get a sense of someone who is extremely out of her depth, kind of on a variety of dimensions. So the... Question: I've been joking about the Eleventh Circuit. The question of whether they would take her off this case is like probably not, just because that's a very extreme remedy, and 
Jack Smith would have to... We're, we're getting there. Yeah, well, Jack Smith would have to decide to pull that trigger, too, which I think could backfire enormously if you try that. And then the, the appeals court <laughs> yeah. is like, nope, you're yeah. stuck with her. Yeah, you have a very... <laughs> p- yeah, talk about pissing <laughs> off the, the judge in your yeah. case, right? So that's you really want to keep your powder dry there. On the other hand, they've already slapped her down once before. Um, and I kind of feel like if they took her off this case, like that would be a blessing for her. Like just end end the suffering for everyone no, she's, involved. She's trashing. She is trashing her judicial. Rep- I mean, I I can't speak for state and local judges, but I think within the federal bench, I don't think there's anyone with a like literally worse reputation at this point than Judge Cannon, and, and I think she knows that, and I can't feel good. Well, that I mean, I think that that's actually really important for understanding the clerk issue. So let me say, all I know about this is what David Latt has written. This is total speculation. But there has been reporting in recent years about how incredibly abusive some judges can be to their clerks. Not all, but some. So, and the the conduct on Cannon's part that Lat describes, like, given that context, I would say, I don't know, I read it and I was like, this is kind of standard issue bad boss behavior. Like, it's not good. I could see why you would want to leave a job. Um, if a boss sort of was disrespectful of your time, worked you really hard, et cetera, et cetera. But in the realm- But, but clerks clerks don't leave for those. Cl- reasons, yeah, so clerks, clerks do not leave. And if you read some of the reporting in recent years about, uh, I'm specifically thinking of the Ninth Circuit here, conduct by Judge Kaczynski and Judge Reinhardt, I can both sides it, um, that- Proud con- of you. <laughs> Conduct that clerks put up with in terms of just like abuse, disrespect, sexual harassment, and did not quit, like it can get really bad. And so I think that the difference here is that in the cases of Judges Kaczynski and Reinhardt, for example, those were both very powerful, well-established, well-respected appellate judges who had reputations of being able to, you know, potentially get you a spot on this as a Supreme Court clerk, which is highly, highly, highly coveted. Judge Cannon is setting her reputation on fire. And so I think- And and, can I ask you just a quick follow up to that? Would then the, you know, the the reverse of that be true? You know, could that then also like hurt a clerk's future prospects? Potentially, If they had Cannon on their their CV? I don't don't know if anyone would necessarily hold it against you, but it is Mm. true that, you know, you go into having a, a federal- a clerkship with a federal district judge, that's like a prestigious thing. Yeah. But then it turns out that that judge is now the judge that everyone laughs at. That's less prestigious. Yeah, it's just embarrassing. You have to like- Yeah, there's less of an incentive to stick it out, right? It's not, you know, oh, well, uh, my judge is horrible to me, but maybe there'll be some light at the end of the tunnel. I don't want to, you know, be tarred with being the clerk that left, whatever. Just like, there's no benefit in staying. There's no light. It's just a cave. You're exactly. Just going deeper. <laughs> the tunnel just yeah. The <laughs> yeah. tunnel just goes down to the center of the earth. Right. Yeah. Where, where where you do the eternal return of this <laughs> case, which which will never end. And and actually, I mean, this is. I mean, I I want to make sure we don't leave without asking this question. And I mean, none of us know the answer, but it's worth asking. Like, when is this thing gonna, when is this shit going to go to trial? I mean, if he loses, I feel like it'll go to trial eventually. I mean, maybe, but this isn't the only. But I mean, this isn't the only motion that we're dealing with. I mean, there was a great piece in the, in the Times by uh, Alan Fourier, right, where, you know, he, he kind of zooms out and, and just points to all of these motions, all of these issues that 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 Cannon has has created. I mean, again, making herself the center of the story. You know, it, this is this thing could just be in limbo forever. Again, it seems unless and until Jack Smith finally just like loses it and, and goes to the 11th Circuit. Yeah, I was I was just going to reference a, a piece in the AP that that quoted uh, a former judge and law professor that said not only should should this case already have started, it, it should, in this interpretation, already be done because <laughs> it was yeah. you know, it, not it's that not complicated. a complicated. Yeah, it's not that that's the thing. It is an extremely simple case. Although there are a lot of complicated SEPA issues, like it's complicated to bring cases involving classified information to trial. That said, I agree. The fact pattern is very simple. He took stuff that didn't belong to him, and he repeatedly yeah. did not give it back. Even the SEPA, even the SEPA issues are much more straightforward than they could otherwise be because the content, because it's not like the content of the actual classified documents is the thing that needs to be introduced, right? It's more just that they're classified. So, you know, as even as far as SEPA issues go, this is pretty simple, but we shall see. All right, let's end it there. But of course, as Scott says, it would not be rational security if we did not have object lessons. Alan, let me start with you. Yeah, so my object lesson is something I actually 
came across like six to nine months ago, but our, our, you know, revisiting Russia for today's topic made me think of it. And that's a really wonderful podcast series. It's one season, it's like 80 episodes uh, by The Economist called Next Year in Moscow. And it's a, it's a, it's a economist journalist. I, I don't remember if he himself is Russian or not, but um, he basically, you know, goes uh, and interviews this kind of generation of young Russian intellectuals and dissidents who have essentially left the country. They fled kind of for political exile and he just talks to them. And it's just, it's a wonderful podcast series. You know, it's really interesting looking to Russia. And it's also, I think, important, you know, you know, there, there are, there are good Russians, right? And and I think it's it's easy, you know, obviously given Russia's appalling behavior in the war in Ukraine, to think that you know they're the Russians are the bad guys and the Ukrainians are the good guys. And yes, the Russians are the bad guys, but you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that there's this this generation of Russians that hate what's happening to their country and are fighting against it. I mean, you know, I guess this is somewhat personal for me in the sense that my parents were Soviet Jews who who fled Russia for political persecution in in the you know in the seventies and eighties. So you know, in a sense, I am the child. Not in a sense, I am the child of a younger generation uh, of this. And uh, you know, it's kind of simultaneously heartbreaking that you know every every generation there's a new generation of, of liberal Russian dissidents. But it's also um, in a sense um, uh, really heartening because despite Russia's just just miserable, brutal history, there is this constant liberal again you know i don't mean in the left right sense uh kind of small l kind of classical liberal tradition in, in russian culture that refuses to die and this is just a really affecting and uh also just very interesting and engaging uh series about those about those folks tyler how about you so it, it's been a while since i've given a musical recommendation uh so i thought i would choose for my object lesson this week, an album that came out last week. It's called Tiger's Blood by Waxahachie, which is the moniker of, of a musician named Katie Crutchfield. She's been a longtime favorite of mine. She had this, this she, her older stuff, which I also love, is more of like lo-fi folk. And then in 2020, she she really opened it up into this country, uh, you know, fuller sound, really beautiful. Uh, that album was called St. Cloud, and I think it, you know, really expanded her fan base. And then she's just come out with this new album called Tiger's Blood. It's an even more refined version of, of, of St. Cloud. It's it's gorgeous. It's, it's an instant classic. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing her uh, in concert in a month, which I'm really excited about. She's always great. So uh, if you have not heard of Waxahachie, definitely check out Tiger's Blood and St. Cloud. For my object lesson, I am going to recommend an article in The Atlantic called Baltimore Lost More Than Just a Bridge by Rachel Goodman Way, which is about the kind of shocking and horrifying collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, which is one of the major arteries um, near the city uh, that collapsed when a cargo ship lost power and drove straight into it. As someone in the region, I was aware of the bridge, but hadn't particularly thought about it. Um, and this article is a really lovely and moving sort of reflection on the bridge itself and what it means to people who live in Baltimore and to, to people in the region and what it means for the city now that it's gone um, and that it may potentially take years to rebuild. Um, I think there are six people who are still missing who were on the bridge when it collapsed. And there's a question of what's going to happen to Baltimore's port, which was a very active port um, and may not be operational while the bridge is, is being constructed or rebuilt. Um, so highly recommend this article. It made me kind of think about this in a, a different way than uh, I had been understanding from just the national news coverage. That brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. Be sure to visit lawfaremedia.org for our show page with links and past episodes, our written work, and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and, for, of course, for information on our other podcast series, including The Aftermath. Be sure to follow us on X, I guess, at <laughs> RITL Security, and leave a rating or review, uh, and sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Jay Venables of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we're edited, of course, by the wonderful Jen Patia. On behalf of my co-host, Alan, and our special guest, Tyler McBrien, and our special guest, Dan Byman, I am Quinta Jurassic, and we'll talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>